Amen. One second. This is enough. So here, it's all take a piece of paper. No looking, no conferring. So in your own time, seven kings of Persia. Remember, no cheating. Uh, when you're done, I'll just wait for everybody to finish, then we'll sort papers. Oh, list out the seven kings of Persia. Sorry. Everyone done? Almost, okay. Brother Douglas, you done? Yeah. Okay. Sister Effie, you done? Just shout out when you're finished. Okay, so for those who have finished, if you uh, just swap them with someone sitting next to you. You could swap again. Or you, could, you could still swap. It still works with three. Everyone else got, everyone's got different papers? Are you done, Brother Jeffrey? Uh, I don't have all of them. 
when, that's fine as many as you have. Could you swap with someone? Okay, go ahead and mark them. And then return them. <laughs> if I said yes, I'd shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, hand it back. Um, Sister Juliana, give us the list of seven. Spelt it. Okay, so it's only two and three that we're missing. Yeah. Um, Sister Daniela. Um, so who got all seven? Okay, uh, most people. Which ones were missing? So you had two and three missing. Which ones were missing? I can't hear you. Sorry. Okay, so you were just you had it wrong from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Did you have all seven though, but just in the wrong order? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sister Denise? Huh? I can't hear? What? Uh, how did you do? Oh, I got them all. You got them all? Oh, okay, I didn't see your hand. Um, at the back, everyone got them or not? I was missing two and three, and those were seven. Two and three were missing? And number six. Number six, Arthur Bainers. Got them all? Okay, so we did pretty well. Okay. Um, so I'll give, I'll just give you the um, the reference for at least four smoothies. There's a couple of references. Um, Prophets and Kings, page 572, paragraph 2. PK 572.2. So this is where it gets a little bit confusing. If you go to your Bibles and go to the book of Ezra, chapter 4, Remember, we've looked at Ezra 7 and Ezra 6. Just going back to Ezra 4. So 
So I don't know if you have marginal readings in your Bible, but they're having difficulties in building the temple. That's what chapter 4 is about. Um, the Samaritans have been have asked if they can help to rebuild the temple and they've been refused by the Jews. Everybody okay where we are in history? The Jews have been in captivity for 70 years. Cyrus has come to the throne. He's released them and allowed them to go back home. Time has gone on and in the process of rebuilding, the Samaritans want to help them but their offer of help is, is basically spurned and there's this tension or rivalry that exists between the Jews and the Samaritans. Are you okay with that, Sister Denise? Yeah, it's just I've always wanted, I've always wondered who the adversaries were when you're saying the Samaritans and so I'm just wondering where that came from. Where the fact that they were Samaritans, where that came from. Uh, it says in my little marginal reading on my Bible, yeah. <laughs> it says Samaritans. <laughs> uh, um, Brother David, th th these Samaritans, who, who are they? Half juice? Okay, anything else you know? Okay, so they don't like each other? Okay, anything else? No? Okay, Sister Catherine? What do you know about Samaritans? The leftovers, I like the way <laughs> the leftovers. So, sorry, uh, the leftovers of the Israelites. Yeah, they, they got destroyed in 722. And they were still around, but they were ruled by other people. Okay, so we've got a date, 722. Um, what happens in 722? You said they're the leftovers. Okay, so the Israelites are destroyed in 722 and the Samaritans are the leftovers. You agree with Brother David? Uh, she's asking you. You said you don't think they were? I don't think they were full blood Jews. Okay, and your question was, they, did, they, did they used to be? Mm -hmm. um, Sister Effie? Mm -hmm. What do you know about Samaritans? Okay, so you've taken this to Isaiah 7, Isaiah 28, is that what you said? Okay, so we'll quickly turn to Isaiah 7 and 28, um, and you've picked up a city called Samaria. Is that, did I understand you correctly? Yep. Yeah. 
Sorry? No, chapter 7 and chapter 28. She said two chapters. She'll give us the verses in a second. Isaiah 7 verse 9. Yeah. Um, just a, when, when, when you said it was, when you said it was first mentioned in Isaiah. That's where I. Just that where you remembered. Yeah, that's okay. Because it's not the first mention of Samaria, okay. but it's where you remembered it. Yeah. Okay, so we're in Isaiah 7 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Yeah? So that's a, a good verse. Um, Sister Juliana, could you explain what that verse means, please? You can't? Or you don't want to? Have a go. Come, 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 come. You choose someone else then. Take your place. <laughs> Which verse? <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> One second. Sister Wendy, you do it for us. Isaiah 7 verse 9. Tell us what this verse says. I'll just give you a second um, <coughs> while you're thinking. Uh, Sister Effie, you said Isaiah 28? Yes. Um, you're going to struggle a little with Isaiah 28. Okay. I think you might struggle a little with Isaiah 28 unless you're going to connect the two. Yes, I'm going to try to okay, so you need Isaiah 7, not Isaiah 28 on its own. Because you won't find Samaria in Isaiah 28. Just if, if yeah. Okay. That's fine. Did everybody get that? She, she gave us Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 7. Two chapters. Isaiah 28 does not have the word Samaria in it. So what she's doing is chain linking verses together. She's got Isaiah 7. And Sister Wendy's going to explain that. And you need to do that before you go to Isaiah 28. And we'll let her explain that in a moment. So all we're doing now is just a small exercise in how to read a verse that perhaps some of us are not familiar with, um, but it's connected to a famous chapter. Isaiah 7 is a famous chapter uh, in our movement. Go ahead, Sister Wendy. I'm not sure, but I'll try. Um, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria Okay, so we'll go with that bit. The head of Samaria, uh, sorry, the head of Ephraim is Samaria. Go with the first bit first. <coughs> the reason is, if you're going to do the second bit, mm -hmm. you should be able to do the first bit because they're both show it, they're both following the same pattern. The head of something. Mm -hmm. So, what do you? We'll, we'll go with Will, William, William Miller's rule. He's got 14 rules. Mm -hmm. We'll target rule one and five. Does anybody really know what rule one and five is? Of Douglas, William Miller's rules. Do you know what rule one and five is? Um, mm -hmm. Can you say no if you don't know? <laughs> well, I don't know top of my head. That's fine. Someone pull the rules up, please. Someone find them. You have them? Okay. 
Uh, so we already have them up now. So read rule number one. Every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Okay. Uh, rule number five. Scripture must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself. If I depend on the we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Okay, read rule number one again, just the first bit. Every word must have its proper bearing. And rule number five, the first bit. Okay, so I'm making a suggestion <coughs> that in your studies, rule one and rule five are the ones that you're going to come up with over and over again. So rule number one and rule number five are the ones that you use most frequently from my experience. Rule number one says what, Sister Daniela? Okay, so you just... Yeah, what does that mean? That means that um, each word is, there's a reason why it's there, there's a function for that particular word, and it should be, it should be given its attention. Okay, just go with the first bit. I think that's sufficient. Repeat what you said. Each word is important. Anybody want to want to add to that? I want to go with each word is important. That's what rule number one says. Anyone else want to want to rephrase it in another way? Go ahead. Each word is important. It has a bearing. It's taking you somewhere. Okay. Um, is that what you think rule number one says? All scriptures is inspired? Okay, rule number five. Read it out. Just the first part. Sister Catherine. Okay, if something is explaining something, what is that? What, what document or book, what kind of a book or document do we call that? Sorry? A dictionary. So, what's rule number five saying? The Bible is its own dictionary. So, if we were super good, really clever, we wouldn't, need, we wouldn't need external dictionaries. We would allow the Bible to be its own dictionary. And the more you can do that, the safer you are in your answers. So rule number five is, the Bible should explain itself, which essentially is its own dictionary. And rule number one is what, Sister Daniela? Every word is important. Every word is important. Okay, so rule number one is a bit tricky, in my opinion. And I don't know if you think it's a tricky rule. Do you think it's tricky, Sister Denise? Not right off hand. I'm just looking at it on the surface. Okay, seems pretty benign to you. Okay, so the problem that I find is we're in Isaiah 7 9 and we're in the first part of the verse and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. Okay? Mm -hmm. So each word has its. Um, what, did you, what word did you say? Each word is important. Okay, so each word is important. So I'm just going to rephrase that and say each word has its importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So you tell me in that one, two, three, four, six, I think it's six words. One is supplied, the word is, but we'll include that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. It's got seven words there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You tell me which word is important. Or should I, uh, let me rephrase it, which word is the most important? I think okay, so when I said the rule itself seems benign, can you see what the problem is already? Mm -hmm. What's the problem with this rule? And the oven is, well, actually... I asked, I asked you which word is important, mm -hmm. so what's the problem with this rule? 
every word. That's not what the problem is, because I'm asking what your opinion is. If I'd asked Sister Rachel what's the most important word in those seven, would she have given the same answer as you? Maybe not. Maybe not. So the rule itself is subjective. The rule is fine in a benign sense, every word has its importance. But if I asked you which is the most important word, you s you'd say head and she might say, no, it's not, it's Ephraim, Ephraim is much more important. So when you're doing your studies and you're employing these rules, rule number one and five are the ones you're going to deal with over and over again. And in the simplified version, it's every word has its proper importance or its weight or its bearing and the Bible should be its own explainer. But rule number one, it depends what your study is. Now, I would ask you which word is important. You said head. But maybe you're really familiar with Isaiah 7. You know, you've been researching it for six months and you're familiar with it. And you're doing study A. You're here in my place, you're teaching the class. And you're saying, we're going to look at Isaiah 7, 9 and we want, to, we want to understand a certain aspect of it. And therefore, r the word head, that might be the important word. But if you could do a separate study on the same verse, and you say, actually, in this separate study, head isn't that important. What we really want to focus on is the word Samaria. So rule number one is not only subjective from person to person, it also can change depending on the focus of your study because we can go to inspiration and it's, it's multi-dimensional it's not this verse is always going to give us the same answer any verse can give us multiple answers depending on the question that we're asking we could ask two or three easy questions for Isaiah 7 9 and we'll get two or three different answers back would you agree with that and depending on the question depends which word are the important ones and which words are not so important. I agree the rule says every word is important, but certain words have more prominence than others. So I want us to remember that when you're looking at what you should try to be doing is thinking rule number one, rule number five. Let the Bible explain itself, that's fine. Rule number one, try and look at Try and understand which words are the important ones. And it depends what you're looking at that will decide which word is the important one and which one isn't. You okay with that, Sister Wendy? Yeah. So, when, out of those seven words, which one would you target? Sister Denise said head. Which one do you think is most important? That's fine, you, you agree? Yeah, I concur as well. I think in this short little part of the verse, head is the one that we want to target because we want to know what does that mean? Because once we can decode what that means, the rest of it is relatively straightforward. Okay, so we'll go with that. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. So simply, what does that mean? You could. The Bible interprets itself, does that include the Strong's because of the language? No, it doesn't, in fact. Strong's does not include the Bible explaining itself. Mm. Um, not saying Strong's is not useful or not good. And we don't need to do a deep word search on this. Just conceptually, if I said the head of Ephraim is Samaria, you have an idea of what head means. Um, so tell us what what you think this is saying. Or we'll go with... Yeah, that's a good word. So, so rephrase that. The leader of Ephraim is Samaria. Okay. So the leader of Ephraim is Samaria. Everybody okay with that? Anybody want to choose a different word? Okay, so, 
we're in verse 7 and perhaps we're not familiar with what Samaria is um, because we live in the 21st century however verse 8 uses the same structure just read that again for us for which one? 8 for the head of Syria is Damascus okay so everyone knows what Damascus is it's a city that's in existence today um, if, okay it is a city in Syria so using that idea then you're inferring that Samaria would also be a city so tell us how you read that first part the head of Ephraim is Samaria what's that saying it looks like the, to me it's, it sounds like capital yeah go ahead and say that then the capital of Ephraim is Samaria okay but then when I go to the next line we'll, we'll, we'll stop with that bit sister uh, Wendy mm -hmm. what do you think Where? Well, Ephraim. I'm not very good with history. I don't know if Ephraim is a city. Okay, so you don't know if Ephraim is a city. Okay. Sister Effie, you brought us here. What is Ephraim? Um, a place? So Ephraim is the name of uh, one of Joseph's sons mm -hmm. and Joseph doesn't have an inheritance, his two sons get the inheritance and then Ephraim becomes a symbol of the ten tribes as they split. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they're called Israel, sometimes they're called Ephraim. So it becomes a symbol of the ten tribes. Um, maybe it's not that easy to see it here but we'll, we'll go with that so the head of the ten tribes is Samaria so I think Sister Denise is correct the capital of the nation of the ten tribes is Samaria okay um, Brother Douglas the second part Isaiah 7-9 Everyone okay with that? Yeah? So, Sister Juliana, what is that second part of the verse saying? If you agreed with uh, Brother Douglas? Just remind us what he said. What does head mean in that context? The leader of Samaria is the, the son of Remaliah. Okay, so we could perhaps use king instead of leader. Might be, might be leader. So the capital of Ephraim is Samaria and the king of Samaria is Remaliah's son. Yeah? Brother David, who is Remaliah's son? Do you know? Okay, does anybody know? No? Um, what software are people using? What software do you use? I use e Okay. Strong's. 
Mm. Have you got um, knives Bible on you? Sorry. Knives. It's just the name of a Bible. Or a dictionary, I should say, not a Bible. Knaves topical, Knaves topical Bible, it's a famous one. Mm. The, the reason I'm asking, there are various tools that, that, that are available on Esau, on most Bible software, that can quickly and easily help you to locate information like that. N A V E. You have Naves? Yeah. So if you had Ramaliah, if you're in the verse and you highlighted Hem Ramaliah and went to Naves, it will tell you who Ramaliah was. Okay. So tell me if you can do that. That's not knaves. Knaves won't do that for you. That's strongs you're doing. Say that again. It's a module on eSword that you da that you download. Ramaliah, and if you go to Naves, it should tell you some history on there and on Ramaliah. Have you found it, anyone? James? Sorry? Okay, so it says the father of Pekah, king of Israel. So, w were you able to find it yet or not? No, not yet. Um, okay. Not Did you, f were you able to look? You don't have it? Okay. You on my sword? Okay. So, you, have you ever downloaded modules from my sword? Okay, so you've never done that. I don't know, uh, soft um, documents or books. You have different documents, different books, different Bibles. So you can download a lot of extra information than, than, than is just the factory version that you receive when you download it. So you've never done that. Okay. Uh, okay. So we've got, he's the father of Pekah. Uh, Pekah is one of the th last kings of Israel. So, we're in Isaiah 7, 9. The capital city of Ephraim, the ten tribes, is Samaria. The leader, or the king of Samaria, is Pekah, who is Ramaliah's son. And then the last part, if you won't believe the promise that God's uh, showing you, you won't be established. So it picks up Samaria. Samaria is the capital city of the ten tribes. And then you took us to Isaiah 28, that says what? What's Isaiah 28? Verse are you in? Um, I'm reading one, two, three. One, two, and three? Yeah, one, two, two, and three. So verse one, mm -hmm. Isaiah 28, verse one, Woe to the crown of pride, 
to the drunkards of Ephraim. Uh, verse 2. Mm -hmm. what, what are you picking up from verse 2? Okay, so verse 2 is about their destruction. Verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. So, Sister Wendy, okay, verse 1, 2 and 3, chapter 28. Just, the, oh, okay, you th we're there, yeah? Are you okay with Isaiah 7? Did you have any? Okay, so that's okay. So in Isaiah 28, we'll just go with verse 1. It says, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. So, the first thing we want to notice there is a literary style. So, you, you've done parables during the week. What's, what's happening, in, um, if we're all in the English, the, the verse is broken down into various parts uh, by those commas. So, what did you notice in the first two, Sister Ruth? What would you describe that as? Let me stop let me stop you there. I'm not asking at the moment to break down what those phrases meant which is what we did before. What I'm asking here, it says, woe to the crown of pride, to the, drunkard of Eve, to the drunkards of Ephraim. What are you picking up from that? I'm not asking you to break down the words. Before we even do that, I want us to notice something. A literary style. Then if you know what that means. Perhaps, yeah. Can you notice something? Can you explain further? Brother Jeffrey, what can you notice? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. You explain. So met that's correct. A metaphor is, a f is like a parable. It's, a, it's another way of expressing that. Uh, Brother James. So if we go back to what we read, it says um, to the, and then there's a comma, it says to the. Can we see that repeating pattern? Woe to the, and then there's a comma, and then it says to the. You can see that, that repeat? So, when you're approaching a verse, you want to not only see which words are important to try and define them, you also want to look for patterns. Um, and this one, it's, it's relatively easy to see a repeat and enlarge here. Or a repeating pattern, which is, an, is a form of parable. That's why I didn't want to say that what you were saying was incorrect. It is a parable, but it's a certain type of parable. It's not a, a classic parable that we're familiar with, that you know, the natural uh, follows to the spiritual, because you, you, it doesn't work like that. You can't say you're natural and the spiritual in this context in that same way that you do a sheep and a person or a shepherd and Christ. It's not that simple. 
Does that make sense, Brother Larry? Yeah, you can see to the crown, to the drunkards, yeah? So we can see it's re the, the Bible is repeating itself. Sister Denise, mm -hmm. so we're going to now use rule number five. What's rule number five? Good. So the Bible explain itself. So when I ask you this question now, make sure you don't explain it. Okay, so I want the Bible to explain, explain it. Obviously you have to answer. So you tell me when it says the crown of pride. What is the crown of pride? Just in the first line. Hmm. The drunkards of Ephraim. Good. So everybody see that? The Bible is explaining itself. So if I were to ask you, um, when we go back to Isaiah 7, 9, we said um, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, the capital of the ten tribes is the city of Samaria, the leader of Samaria is Pekah, who was Remaliah's son, so you can see this cascading pattern that's going on there. It's kind of like a repeat and enlarge, but it's not a classic repeat and enlarge. We couldn't say that Pekka is Samaria. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's this cascading pattern. So we're in here. It says, to the woe, sorry, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. So Sister Denise says the the crown of pride is the drunkards of Ephraim. What's that talking about? The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim. If we factor in Isaiah 7, 9, what's, what's it talking about or talking, or who is it talking about or what is it talking about? So the, my question is, either you, I would ask, what is the crown of pride or who are the drunkards of Ephraim? Does that make sense, mm. Sister Wendy? No? Okay, so if I were to ask you, the drunkards of Ephraim, the drunkards are what, according to the verse? The crown of pride. Okay, so we, we can do that, yeah? So we've got the people who are drunk, um, so it's not any people that are drunk, it's the people who are drunk, where? From what place? From Ephraim. From Ephraim. So they're the drunkards uh, of Ephraim. And who are the drunkards of Ephraim? Who are these people that are drunk? It's the crown of pride. Okay, so what is a crown? Okay, so it can be your head. What else is it? Um, something that shows kingship. Okay, so it's a hat that shows authority or power. Okay, so what do you think it is? Do you think it's talking about the rim of your head, the crown, or you think it's talking about the hat? Okay, why would you think that? Perhaps because of this? Okay, so the crown of pride mm -hmm. is a symbol of leadership. So who's drunk? The leadership, the leadership is drunk. Mm -hmm. So who's this talking about? The if we go back and factor in Isaiah 7, because that's what Sister Effie wanted to do. Remember, we're only in this passage because we've looked, we took Ephraim and we got Ephraim from Isaiah 7. So she's linked them together. So what is this talking about? The leadership is and where is the leadership? Isaiah 7. Where are they? What are they? 
we had how many types of leadership did we have in Isaiah 7? Remember there was repeat, it says the head, the head. So it's at least two. two. So t tell me what the heads are. Um, Samaria and Samaria. Okay, so it's the, c the capital city, that's one of the heads or the leaders, and the other one is Pekka. So we've got Samaria or Pekka. So what is it here? Oh. P A K? No, P E K. Yeah. I just um I didn't finish it off. Oh, okay. So what's it referring to here? Is it referring to Pekka or is it referring to Samaria when it's talking about this? Pekka. So you think Pekka? That's fine. I'm just gonna change this a little bit to say the king. Is it talking about the king or is it talking about the city? So you're saying the king. Uh, Sister Refi, this was your verse. Would you agree with that? He's talking about the king. So woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. So and we're not going to break down the verse too much, it's perhaps a little bit involved, but it picks up the phrase, which are on the head of the fat valleys. What does that mean, Sister Catherine? The head of the fat valleys. Let me ask you a different question. The head of the fat valleys, um, do you think that would be talking about a person? So that's not talking about a person then. So we know the verse itself then isn't just, it's not as simple to just say it's a king. Not denying that it might be a king in the first part, but when you start going into the verse, the head of a fat valley, if we're gonna use the, the idea that a head is someone that's in something that's in charge, uh, kings are not heads of fat valleys. Agree with that? Okay, so what is it? What is the head of a fat valley? The people. Okay, so when we're looking at a verse, we're approaching it. We don't know what the verse is saying. We don't know what it means we need to start applying some kind of rule, some kind of systematic methodology to try to interrogate it. What have we done so far, Sister Ruth? Tell me some of the things we've already discussed this morning. So we have established that Liam's rule has a plan. Okay, um, name the ones that we've spoken of. We've spoken of the first one, which is that every, every word... In your own words. Yeah. So rule one says every word is important, but we didn't say that. We, we adjusted the rule and rephrased it in a different way. Read rule one. Read rule one for us, just the first part. Every word must have its proper Okay, so you did it correctly. It says every word is important or has a relative importance. But what did I say? I didn't, I didn't, do, the, I didn't do the rule that way. Okay, so that's what I said. When, you, when you're approaching a, 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 a passage or a set of words, look for the key word that would help you in your particular study. So I've adjusted the rule slightly. Every word is important. That's what that rule says. But I'm saying there are certain words that are more important than others. And if we're doing a study, we want to try and say which word is important. 
Okay, so we've used rule number one. What else did we look at? So we also um, looked at rule number five. Rule number five. It says that the Bible should explain itself with its, its own dictionary. So the Bible should explain itself. So we've done those. What else have we looked at? Ways of, in, of approaching verses. Okay, so we've looked at repeat and enlarge, and at first sight it's not obvious to see that, but Brother James showed us that it says, to the, to the, and when it's pointed out, you, can say, you say, okay, well, it's easy to see. So we looked at rule one, rule five, repeat and enlarge. Repeat and enlarge is only a small subset of what topic, or what subject title? or area of investigation? Parables. So parables cover a lot of territory, much more than we think. It's not as simple as saying natural and spiritual, because this is not natural and spiritual really. It's a bit more sophisticated than that. Repeat and enlarge is a form of parables. So we've looked at things. So another thing that we want to think about as we're approaching this verse, because We've gone from Isaiah 7 to Isaiah 28, and we've worked out that drunkards of Ephraim, the crown of pride, we've seen the repeat and large, and Sister Wendy says, this looks like people, drunkards, it sounds like people, so um, it's the people who have, who have pride, it talks about the crown, so it looks like it's talking about a king. We had the name Pekka from Isaiah 7, Pekka might be dead by the time this history is being fulfilled. So that's why I said that I've swapped it from Pekka to King. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because I'm not sure that Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 28 is exactly the same history, same year. Uh, we don't know that. But we also had Samaria in Isaiah 7. The head is Samaria, the head is the king. So it seems the first part of the verse is talking about people or kings. But then it says, the head of the fat valleys. So what we want to now look at, if I said the head of the fat valleys, which is the important word for you, Brother David? Um, I would say, what's the head? Head, Brother Douglas? I can't hear you, sorry? I'll say head. Head? Sister Catherine, this was your question. Head? Okay, what was my question to you? Okay, so you said it wasn't. So my question was, is the head of the fat valleys kings or people? And you said no. Why do you say no? How do you know it's not people? What's making you think it's not people? If you're not sure, just say you're not sure. Okay, so I'm going to re I'm going to re 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 read this to you. Okay. So, the head of the palatial palace. Okay, the head of the palatial palace. Now, what are we talking about? Okay. So, why have you changed your answer? Okay, so what words have I changed? I changed to palace from what? 
I changed something that was in the verse and I changed it to the word palace. What word did I change to palace? Valley. So my question to you now is, what is the important word? Sorry? Valley is the important word. Can we see that, Brother Douglas? Valley is the important word because it's now defining what the head would be. So, depending on what your focus is, depends on what the important word is. So, because we've been going through this, head seems the intuitive word that's important. Because we want to understand what the head means. But to understand what the head means, you have to go to the context, and it's the word valley that's going to shape and define what head means. So she got the answer correct to begin with. The head can't be about people. People aren't, in, uh, aren't the leaders of valleys. I don't go to a valley and say, um, do what I want, do what you're told to do. It doesn't work that way. But as soon as I change the word valley to palace, who lives in palaces? Who's in charge of a palace? It's the king. So you, it defines what that head is. So the defining word is valley, or the important word, which brings us to another principle. Are we okay how we approach that? Brother Larry, does that make sense? It, it, when we start studying, some, what's difficult is that you think you've got it. You think, okay, we've got the heads, it's all working good. And then you get to the next bit and everything that you thought was okay just gets sort of torn up and you think, oh, I thought I got this. And it's a lot harder than you first think. And, and, and it is. I don't want to pretend that it isn't. Um, but that's the beauty of coming together. It's not that I know more than you. It's when you come together and mind works with mind, you, you can see things. Um, okay, so valleys is the important word I'm suggesting. And if we were to look at concepts or ideas, valleys are to do with geography. If we're okay with that? Mm -hmm. So if I were to talk about geography, would I be talking about kings or cities, Sister Wendy? Cities. Talking about cities. So now what we're doing is we're introducing a geographical model into the verse and we want to switch to geography now. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. it, it tells us to talk about geography. It, it, it points us to geography. So now when we, we want to start thinking about geography. What do I mean by that? If you go to, don't turn there, if you went to Revelation 14, verse 6, there's an angel flying in the midst of heaven. Verse 8, another angel comes. Verse 9, another angel comes. And we get to about verse 12. Often we don't talk about the verses that come after that, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. But if we were to look at those verses, Revelation 14, the last part of the chapter, it's actually shown here on this chart. Um, you've got verse 6, verse 8, verse 9. So you've got the verses there. And then this is the last part of the chapter. Are we okay with that? Check Revelation 14. So you can see some of the symbology. And for me, if we were looking at the symbology there, what would be the key concept if we were looking here at this? I don't know if you can see the picture work. Brother Jeffrey, what would be the key theme or the, I'll say the key word but this is a picture. What would be the key thought here that you're seeing? Come right, come right up close. We've got Jesus. There's an angel telling Jesus what to do. There's another angel and there's a th another angel who's telling this angel what to do. So you've got, four you've got four beings. We can split them into two and two. And in the first coupling, what's happening? 
and in the second coupling same, same thing and what are they telling them to do I don't know if you can read it from there come right up close what are they telling them to do can you see the banner right there and this one says so they're saying the same thing yeah so what would be the premier symbol that's being brought to view here he tells them what to do and this person and this person are doing the same thing what, what, what have they got in their hand sickle. they've got a sickle so thank you We've got, we've got sickles now. So what imagery is being brought to view here, Brother David? Harvest. Harvest. Or we could call it a model of agriculture. So Revelation 14 really is a model of agriculture. We're here in Isaiah 28 verse 1. And what model have we got? Sister Wendy? Geography. Geography. So we want to spot these different models, whether it's geography or whether it's agriculture. When you can do that, it helps you to approach the verse in a, in a, in a right way. Are you okay with that, Sister Denise? Yeah? So Revelation 14, its focus is about these sickles that are doing this work. A sickle is an instrument for harvest. It actually says... Um, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. Reaping is to do with harvest. Um, and if you were to look at the verse, it talks about the harvest period. So we've got agriculture and we've got geography. And there are some other ones that we could think about. What's the one that we've already discussed in our class? What model have we discussed in our class already? Sister Catherine? Not today. If you're not sure, say you're not sure. Sorry? Building, building which is not what we're building. What model would we call that? We'll go with building, that's fine. So we've got agriculture, we've got geography, and I'll call it construction or building. Sister Denise? Uh, Matthew 25. No, you know Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. <laughs> then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, five of whom were wise, five of whom were foolish. So you know that. Uh, so what's that about? What's that story about? It's about virgins. And what are those virgins doing? For what? So what's the story about? Marriage. So we've got, you list the, list the ones that we've got so far. The themes or the models. What's this model about? Okay, so we've got this amount. Remember the last one? Sister Catherine? Construction, building. We did that already. Day for a year. Uh, Brother Douglas, day for a year, the Bible verses. The day for a year? Mm-hmm. Bible verses. Yes, please. Okay, and we pulled up some symbology from those verses, or at least one of those verses, that helped us to understand one of these themes. Do you remember that? You weren't here when we did it initially, but I think you were here when we... Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, okay, Brother Larry? Brother 
Brother Jeffrey, which verse? Numbers or Ezekiel? Um, to, a model that we'd already looked at. We didn't look. We looked at a model at one of those four before, and we we launched into that investigation from one of these two verses. Ezekiel four six. We looked at Ezekiel four six. How does Ezekiel four six give us one of these models? Which model did it give us? Agriculture, geography, marriage, or construction? It gave us construction. How does Ezekiel, how does a verse, Ezekiel 4 6, give us construction? Do you remember how we did that? Can I read the verse? You can, but it won't help you. Because it wasn't, it wasn't the words of the verse that helped us to do that. Okay, I'll help you. We went to another Bible verse. Sister Juliana, what other Bible verse did we go to? Sister Effie? So we went to John 2.20. And John 2.20 said, there are 46 years to build a temple. So how does Ezekiel 4.6 help us? Excellent. So we took up Isaiah, sorry, Ezekiel 4.6 and we noticed it said 4.6. We took that as a symbol and this is not just the words, this is just a Bible reference. 46, someone remembered John 2.20, which spoke about 46 years. So we already spoke about a construction model in the Millerite history that was the construction of a temple. So we'd already looked at construction. Um, we haven't looked at Matthew 25, but we know that's marriage. Gave an example here of Revelation 14, which is agriculture. Agriculture comes up a lot. And now we've noticed geography. So if we're talking about geography then, and we're in Isaiah 28, what is the head of the fat valleys? Sister Effie. No, no, don't, it wasn't palatial palace. I, that was just, that was my way of showing Catherine ha, what the important word was. So don't, don't be deceived that I'm, I was defining what a fat valley was. It's not a palace. Okay, so you're asking me about the head. What is the head of the fat Okay, the capital. Okay, you mentioned about mountains earlier. I think it was you. What, what, what did you say about mountains? Uh, I noticed that there's a mountain called Ephraim. Okay, so Samaria. It's a city. Where's it built? So in the olden days, where would you want to build your cities? Because if you build it on the th in the valley, all your enemies are going to come and pour into you. Where would you want to build a city? On a mountain. So they found a mountain called Samaria and they built a city on it. They called it Samaria. So it's built on the hill of Samaria. Okay, so the head of the fat valleys, what's it, what's it saying? Samaria. 
So Samaria is a mountain or a hill and it's the head of the fat valleys. So the imagery here becomes a bit complex, so I'm not expecting us to, um, to do this. By the way, it's same in verse 4, Isaiah 28 verse 4, the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower and as a hasty fruit. So I just want to show us a bit of geography. I can't remember the number of hills, but I think it might be seven, it may not. There's a chain of hills that looks like this. They're not, it's not obvious when you, if you went to a map, like Google Maps, but when you're there, I think it's, it's more easy to see. Okay, so if I were to sort of to get this and refigure it, um, no, I'll leave it at, at that as that at the moment. So these are hills, and in between each hill there'd be a slight valley. Um, so this is a simplified version of the geography. This area here would be a valley. Okay, and it's uh, rich and fertile. So if this is a rich, fertile valley, which would be the head? The bigger one, yeah? So I've, I put it here deliberately. So this would be the head of the fat valleys. Fat means what? Sorry? Fertile, yes, fertile valleys. And the head of these fertile valleys is going to be the hill of Samaria, where they build the city, the most prominent hill, the most famous place. So Sister Wendy uh, made an important point when she said about the crown. She said it, couldn't be, it could be a hat, but what else could it be? What else, can it, what else is the crown? It's the top of your head, it's this bit here. Okay, so there's a lot of imagery or symbology that's going on here. There's this geography here, but it mentions in verse 4 this fading flower. So there was a tradition um, in this part of the country that on, fest on festival days, what they would do is make a garland. Everybody know what a garland is? Sister so Rachel, what's a garland? A wreath, can we change it to a different word from wreath? Sorry? Or a chain, so I can call it a chain, a chain of flowers, but it's a wreath. Um, and so what they would do is they'd get these flowers, turn them into a, a wreath or a chain, and they would put them where? On their head, on the crown. So it's not a literal crown, but there's all this imagery that's brought to view in, in, the, in these words. There's a geography bit. There's a festival where um, they would beautify themselves with these flowers, which explains verse 4, because the flowers should look pristine and beautiful, but they're actually fading flowers. Okay. So... All we've done so far is just seen how we can use rules to understand verses. So I just want to uh, summarise and add some information. So we spoke about Samaritans. Uh, why did we get to Samaritans? Uh, uh, one second. What? Sorry? I don't understand what you're saying. Yes, I know, well, I know I'm, I'm finishing, I'm summarising, yes. Why did we get to Samaria? Why did the, the subject even come up? Why did we ask the question, who the Samaritans are? Yes, so we're looking at false murders, um, which is which king number, didn't it, Denise? Which king number is he? False murders. Three, King number three, and there's a connection between him and the Samaritans. Um, in Ezra 4, it says, the adversaries of Judah. 
the adversaries of Judah are the Samaritans. So I asked, who are the Samaritans? So the Samaritans is what we all said. They're these ten tribes. The ten tribes of Israel become the Samaritans. The name itself, Samaritans, comes from the geography. They built their capital city at the head of this valley system on the hill of Samaria and they picked up the name Samaritans from that. Um, 723, 722, 721 Sister Catherine gave us 722. In that history the Assyrians, an enemy, are going to come to the ten tribes and destroy them. That's Isaiah verse, uh, sorry, 28 verse 2. They're going to do that because these people have become drunk. I'm not sure what that exactly means, but we'll say they've become drunk or intoxicated with false doctrines. So they're in apostasy and they're going to be punished. They're going to be punished by the person in Isaiah 28 verse 2. When he destroys them, they become scattered and they end up intermingling with the Gentiles and they become the Samaritans that we know in the New Testament. So that's where these Samaritans, um, the, the concept or the idea of where they've been or, or where they come from. So we, when, I, when Sister White says the Samaritans, she's using a New Testament term that we're all familiar with the Samaritans and the Jews, but their root comes, or their history comes from this destructive work um, by this empire that comes and destroys them, the Assyrians in this history, which is connected to what Brother Mark, uh, Marker was doing yesterday when you were doing, I think, the Seven Thunders, or the Seven... Seven times, the 25, 20, I think that's what I saw on the board work. So that history there is the roots or the origins of the Samaritans. They come from a place called Samaria. It's a country, it's a hill, it's a city. It's the ten tribes who are going to be destroyed because of their sins. They get scattered, they intermingle with other nations and they become the Samaritans. All of this is happening over a hundred years before false Smyrdis. So it's the ten tribes, Ephraim, they get destroyed, they get scattered, they intermingle with various nations more than a hundred years before false Smyrdis is coming. So by the time you get to false Smyrdis, these people are now doing their own thing they're not really considered part of God's people. The ten tribes are scattered. They're now going to be called Samaritans and they want to help with reconstructing the temple. The Jews say no and then they, in Ezra 4 verse 1, they become the adversaries of the people. Just want to mention one small point which is why we got here in the first place. In Ezra 4, 7, it says Artaxerxes. And in the days of Artaxerxes, so it's a bit tricky because Artaxerxes is king number what? It's king number seven. But this Artaxerxes is not number seven king. This Artaxerxes is actually king number three. He comes by a different name. So let me read what Ellen White says. During the reign of Cambyses, the work of the temple progressed slowly. And during the reign of false Murdis, it was even worse. She doesn't say that, that's my paraphrase. And false Murdis is called Artaxerxes in Ezra 4 verse 7. So it's all a bit tricky if you're not careful. Artaxerxes in chapter 4 is not Artaxerxes in chapter 7. 
he was given another name. You can call him Artaxerxes, or you can call him False Smyrdis. So that's why we went here, because that's False Smyrdis is not given in the scriptures. Um, Alan White wants to point it out historically that it, his name was Artaxerxes in Ezra 7, and he's associated with the enemies who are the Samaritans. And the Samaritans, ten tribes. We'll recover that, we'll recap this um, after breakfast. What was the reference? PK 572, paragraph 2. The one I gave it early on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We want to ask for a blessing upon the study that we've just done. Help us, Lord, to continue to be blessed and guided by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.